Hello, I'm Andrew Kamei-Deitch. This is Pre-Modern Japan. Today we're going to be talking about the Muromachi period from 1336 to 1467. Now, Muromachi period saw the entrenchment of warriors as a political force in Japan. We've been tracking the development of warriors through several lectures now. We've seen how they rose up and became more and more important in the political scene. How during the medieval era, warrior government became extremely important through that dual polity system we've talked about. So it's during the Muromachi period that warriors really become kind of solidified as part of the political system. Well. What happened to the divided royal lines that I talked about previously? And how did the Muromachi Bakufu compare to its predecessor, the Kamakura Bakufu, which we've talked about before? Well, let's take a look. We'll start by talking about the era of the southern and northern courts, called Nambukcho in Japanese. So this is an era that reaches from 1336 to 1392, where we see the split between the royal court. We have one in the north and one in the south. So let's find out a little bit more about that. Okay, well, by way of comparison, here we have information concerning the southern court, and here we have the northern court. So each of them had a central location. Of course, the southern court is based in Yoshino, whereas the northern court is based in Kyoto. The northern court is run by the senior line, the Jumyoin, whereas the southern court is run by the junior line, the Daikakuji. Each side had some particular advantages in this conflict. The southern court held the three treasures. When Godaigo retreated from Kyoto and fled to the south to establish his southern court in exile, he was quite clever. He left behind three treasures, but upon arrival at Yoshino said, Haha, those were fakes, and I have the real ones with me. And so this gave his side a great advantage because, of course, the three treasures represented the legitimacy of the sovereign. And therefore, this was a very powerful propaganda tool from the southern court's point of view. They also were able to establish relations with China, which were again important from a point of view of establishing legitimacy. If you can have the Chinese court recognize you as being the official government of Japan, then this of course has some weight to it. The northern court, on the other hand, they had the support of the Muromachi Bakufu, which were in practice the actual government, and of course had all of this warrior power backing them up. So this was nothing to sneeze at either. They also had different power bases. The southern court had a significant power base in Kyushu, so over in western Japan, whereas the northern court had its base first of all in Kyoto, where the Bakufu was based, but also in Kanto, so the eastern part of Japan where the Kamakura Bakufu had originally been based, and which had continued to remain an important power base for warriors. Now, the southern court took a lot of effort to try and establish their perspective and convince people that they were, in fact, the legitimate court. You might recall that way back in our very first session, when I talked about the three treasures, I introduced the intellectual Kitabatake Chigafusa, the author of the Jinno Shotoki, a work which we can translate as Chronicle of the Authentic Lineage of the Divine Sovereigns. And this was a book that celebrated Japan's royal history, but argued for the legitimacy of the southern court, talking about the three treasures and how these had been passed down from the sun goddess herself, and how these were, could serve to legitimate the southern court. So that's essentially what he was doing, since he was, of course, a southern court supporter. Another work that reflected southern court perspectives at the time was the Taiheiki, and the Taiheiki was important because it also celebrated the southern court, played up the heroic royal warriors, and created this kind of stereotype of Ashikaga Takeoji as a villainous figure who couldn't be trusted. An image that was, of course, later resurrected in the 19th century by the modern Japanese government, but had a vested interest in trying to convince people that unquestioning loyalty was a virtue, and that therefore we should follow Kusunoki Masashige's example, rather than that of Ashikaga Takaoji, who was presented as a kind of traitorous person who could not be counted on. 
Now, it was actually Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, the third of the Ashikaga shoguns, who tried to reunite the two courts and end the conflict in 1392. Having successfully brought this about, the subsequent royal lineage was descended from the northern, not the southern line, which is quite interesting because later on in history it was decided that the three 1392 northern rulers were seen as pretenders. And so we have this rather strange situation where the southern court are today seen as the legitimate uh, line of descent from Godaigo over here, 96, down to Gomurakami, Shoke, Gokamayama, and so forth. And yet the northern court was just seen as pretenders, except for after the unification, whereupon they suddenly become legitimate. And so we have Gokomatsu Tanno over here in the very strange position of having started out his career being considered a pretender to the throne and ended his career as a properly legitimate sitting Tenno. So. Let's talk a little bit about the Muromachi Bakufu itself. Now, the Bakufu, unlike the Kamakura Bakufu before it, was based in Muromachi Kyoto, from where it took its name. Therefore, it could rule and oversee the court, so there was no more dual polity. At this point, the Bakufu is firmly in command of the country itself. But, again, the court does simply not disappear from the scene. It continued to be important as a source of culture and authority, and also many elite warriors of the Bakufu participated in court culture. Bakufu authority was decentralized. They employed a rather ad hoc method for trying to manage local power holders. So here we have an image of the so-called Flowery Palace. This was the residence of the Ashikaga and the government offices built facing Muromachi Avenue in Kyoto. The Kamakura Bakufu, in its basic structure, recall, worked like this. There was the Shogun at the top, and then we have the Samurai Dokuro, the Manshujo, and the Mandokuro. In practice, of course, the Hojo regents inserted themselves into the middle of the system, and so we have here the Shiken, the regent in the middle, the person with the real power. Well, how did this compare to the Muromachi Bakufu? The Muromachi Bakufu was quite similar, but instead of having a regent, we had a deputy shogun in the middle. However, in the Muromachi system, the shogun did actually command considerable authority, and the deputy shogun really was an assistant rather than someone who had kind of the power behind the scenes like uh, with the Hojo regent in the Kamakura system. So it's interesting that uh, on the surface, these two systems look kind of similar. They have a figure at the top and then someone underneath them. But in the Kamakura system, the power of those positions is somewhat inverted because it was the regents that had the real power. Whereas in the Muromachi Bakufu, it's initially the shogun who truly does have authority. Although quite quickly, that power was passed on to others, not a regent, as in the case of the Kamakura Bakufu, but actually to a group of very powerful warrior families who soon became able to manipulate the shogun. Now, that's the central system. How did local power work in the Muromachi Bakufu? The Bakufu appointed provincial governors called Shugo, much like the previous Bakufu had done. But in addition to military affairs, these shugo actually gained control over other matters as well. Administration, legal, taxation issues, they gained a great amount of power over local affairs, far beyond the ability of the shugo from the Kamakura era. Therefore, over time, they became known as shugo daimyo, so these great name shugo, local lords who were increasingly de ind uh, independent and directly controlled local areas. And so, as they rose to power and gained more and more strength in the areas under their control, the bakufu correspondingly lost more and more control over the provinces. So, in conclusion, the Muromachi Bakufu replaced the dual polity and reunited the royal lines, but it never had absolute power. It was a decentralized institution with generally ad hoc policies and only loose control over local elites. As we'll see next time, this is something that eventually would bring about its destruction. Thank you very much.